Good morning, everyone. My name is Aries, Aries Flores. Our uh, speaker for today is Hans Eknen. He provides a linchpin leadership and consulting for rapid evolving companies with 20 of over 25 years of uh, use experience creating workflow and support optimization solution across diverse industries. Hans is a part of a SunTrust innovation program teams of a SunTrust bank where he helps develop disruptive programs and products and drive innovation. Process improvement and quality teammate engagement across enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our speaker, Hans Eichner. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we've got a nice, cozy group, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna push you out of your comfort zone because I want this to be more of a discussion. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of fun. So as we go through this, this is meant to be a overview of um, security topics. It's basically, I'd almost title it, everything that I thought I knew about security ended up being wrong or so little. Um, and after three years of managing the work stream that delivered all of the software and systems for our security department, I realized how little I knew and how much better job I could have done. Um, so a few administrative things to kick things off. First. Um, Please stay connected for anyone tweeting. Um, at Project Summit is the um, uh, Twitter account for the conference. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll have this information on the end. Um, and I've got business cards up here, so feel free to grab them. Uh, for those of you that are new to Twitter or experiencing more, um, hashtag BAOT and PMOT are two great tags to search for. That's Project Management and Business Analysis on Twitter. And it's a great, it's all the conversations in the world that are happening around those two topics. So, uh, great uh, session there. Um, some wonderful disclaimers. You can't have a security presentation without lots of disclaimers. So, unless otherwise listed in the presentation, all the data, all the facts, all the information I'm giving is from the Verizon uh, Data Breach Investigations Report. It would sound really boring, but it's actually a hilarious read. They have a lot of fun with it. It's, it's not... Uh, boring at all. Um, everything that I'm going to talk about is my own personal opinions or based on the statistics and information that I'm sharing. Um, it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, SunTrust Bank that I work for and absolutely no information in this presentation directly pertains to the bank. Um, none of the examples I'm going to give, nothing at all result, uh, has anything to do with the bank so that I can remain employed by the said bank. This session's for you, like I said, so please participate. Stop me as you have questions. We're going to be rolling through some information. If there's topics you want to discuss after the fact, um, I'll be here until Wednesday morning, so please pull me aside. Um, challenge some of the things I've said. I've been challenged quite a bit uh, in the past with, uh, I've had some security experts who have found the nuances in some of this, so this is a higher level. So if this isn't what you're looking for, I'm not offended if you want to quick hop in another session, but I promise, money back guarantee for this session, you will enjoy um, the information. Um, also, absolutely, this and with all of my presentations, no animals were harmed during the creation of this presentation, but I do encourage you to support your pet rescue groups. So let me start off with a little bit of an overview.
So when we think about security, a lot of times we're thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about our passwords, we're thinking about our accounts, we're thinking about identity theft. But that happens to the systems and the companies that we work, that we do business with, which also happens to be all of the customers, all of the clients that do business with our companies. And really, we're the first opportunity. So how many BAs do we have here? PMs? Other? Okay. So this is primarily looking at how the business, how business analysis and requirements need to be incorporated throughout the project to take into account security, risk, and fraud topics. As project managers, though, it's really important because you set the schedule, you have help set the scope to direct and make sure that these things happen. Make sure that the right stakeholders are engaged. And it's only through that tight collaboration between your leads, your PM, and your BA that we can be successful. And the sooner we start talking about these things will save us hours and hours of re rework. So if we're not the advocate for data integrity, security, fraud prevention, we think it's someone else's job, we've already failed. It's already too late. Um, and just like we are looking to represent what the business need is, what the business value, security and fraud prevention and risk management are important business requirements. In some cases, they might be the most important requirements we're dealing with, because functionality here and there, our clients, our users might not know. When you have a breach, when you have a problem, um, it's not nearly as evident in the project life cycle, but becomes extremely important for the company's reputation. So thinking about that, how many people have dedicated security groups at their company that they work with? How many that work with them directly on the project and are engaged as part of the project? Okay, good. Um, there is a shift. Are you both in highly regulated businesses? Thanks. Yep, okay. The more regulated, the better they're doing at this sort of thing, or at least the better the engagement. So just think about, and it doesn't have to be, and I won't do show of hands on this, um, think about whether it's not maybe not your last project, but one of the biggest and most important projects you worked on. Did you make sure that the access control model, the people that could access the system and what they could do was really, really solid and tied down? What about making sure that the records were used and you knew the life cycle of the record and how long you were gonna store and where you were gonna store and making sure that people had the right access? How many people secured their system against a third party vendor that your company does business with? One, okay? It's not something that we think of, but all of our systems, whether we like it or not, are interconnected, which means it's not just our system that's the problem. And to illustrate that, we want to have a little bit of fun. So first, we've got our Data Breach Hall of Fame. So if you really want to make the news for doing a horrible job, here's your competition. These are the number of records that were stolen. Um, and then the honorable mention, this case goes to Sony Pictures, which was actually blackmailed um, with the information that was leaked. So, um, how many people were fans of Target when you were here? <laughs> Not really? So, Target, one of the biggest flops trying to enter a new market. Obviously, they did not engage the right project managers and analysts to figure out how to come into a market. Well, similarly, they had a huge um, flop, which was their recent data breach. And this one hit the news uh, worldwide a little bit more. But what's most interesting is how it actually happened. So I want to trace this as a model so that the rest of this will make sense and you understand why this is all interconnected. So the first thing is, in Target, it took about three, almost four weeks to even discover they had a problem. Actively losing credit card accounts during this entire period. In their defense, the same type of attack hit Home Depot, and the FBI noticed, notified them two years after they had been infected and were losing information. So the first thing, and this is still the most common, the biggest thing that you can't get around is users are stupid. Our users, whether we like it or not, will make mistakes, will do dumb stuff, and the phishing scams are getting better and better. So the first thing that happened is, Target has a mechanic, uh, Fazio Mechanical. They're the refrigerant contractor, meaning in all of their stores, this is the person that, that takes care of their air conditioning system. Pretty harmless, you think. 
Somebody clicked on an email which launched Citadel, which is a Zeus variant virus. Come on in, grab a seat up front, we've got prizes. Um, and it infected their computers. And so in the brackets you see the reason, some of the reasons. So this was a phishing scam, and they weren't running adequate antivirus. They actually weren't running any antivirus. They did monthly network scans, but weren't running anything locally. So the hackers basically gathered information off their systems. And what they found out was this company was logging into Target to be able to submit invoices against the work they were doing. How many people here use Ariba? common spend management tool for invoicing and bill presentment. So using the login information for their account to be able to bill, they logged into Target's network through, um, excuse me, um, through um, Ariba. Then once they were in, they started scanning the network because Ariba uses a Active Directory login. That Active Directory login is no different than anyone's personal login or it had carries different permissions. So using that, they started looking for all the Windows servers that weren't properly patched. When they found one, they were able to do a SQL injection, add code to that server. Now that server then contacted servers which were properly patched and secure. But because the connection between those servers was trusted, they were able to get into basically the systems that were processing credit card accounts. So when you think, when you swipe your card, you're like, hey, it's an encrypted transaction. It's not always encrypted. There is a point in time where that number and information exists before it gets encrypted and stored in your system. So the hackers used a RAM scraper. Basically, every 20 seconds, it would download data from what was in the active computer memory before it had been encrypted, and then would send it back out. And this is what they were doing over and over again. So that was using a, a Trojan. The cost to date for Target because of this is over $252 million they've spent because of this one breach over several weeks. Now, could that happen to any of us, any of our systems? I mean, when you think about it, any vulnerability in your network can now affect your system. So, let's take it, so, so why is this so important? Well, first, 80% of the attacks, 80% of the loss we have is external. But that still means that 20% is coming from internal. When we talk about phishing scams, 23% of recipients, basically one in four people. So in this room, one of you on each side of this room would end up opening uh, one of the phishing emails. Um, and 11% will click and open attachments. 50% of the people who will do that will do it within the first hour. So by the time you realize you're getting hit with a phishing attack, half of all of the people will have already clicked through and infected your systems. 99.9% .9 of the vulnerabilities, published, public, these are problems that can be exploited, are still active and available over two years after they're posted. Um, the good news at this point is only 0.03% of mobile devices are infected each day, so that's still fairly low, and a lot of the attacks are anything that would hit a mobile website is kind of hitting a phone direct, so um, there's, it's, not as important, it's not as critical as some of the other areas. So how much does this cost? Fifty to $87,000 per thousand records. So think about all the records you keep in your system. And then that's going to be the cost, uh, estimated cost to the business if those get compromised. Um, fit, uh, when we look at that 20% of internal losses, over half of those were because people had privileges that were more than they needed to do their job, or they used their advanced privileges. Think about this. Do you know any developers that have local admin rights to their laptops? Do they have direct root access to a database? Do they have root access to the server? Well, I need it for development, and we don't, uh, we don't have a way of obfuscating data from production into the test environment, so we test with live data. What you're basically saying is anybody doing development can get any of your records. And we'll look at that a little bit at the end. So what happens if I just make a mistake? So when we talk about just mistakes, errors that happen in our day-to-day -day lives, 30% of the time, we send information to the wrong people. I type in an email address, I get the auto-populate, I click out the wrong name, and I send them something that they shouldn't have seen. 
17% of the time, we are publishing non-public content to public web servers, to shared drives, to open websites, to servers that are open to the network, uh, to uh, outside your network. Um, and 12% of the time, we're just not disposing of records correctly. This is when you hear medical records and, uh, or that are thrown in dumpsters. Laptops that are sent to the aftermarket without wiping and destroying the hard drive. That's where some of these things come from. So the roughest part of it is we can't win. Every one of our companies, every company has been or will be hacked to some degree or another. And we don't have enough time, resources, money, or knowledge to stop it. So we have to decide what we have time for, and we have to chip away. So we have to look at what risk we're willing to tolerate, and chip as deep as we can go within the time frames, within the budgets we have. So let's look at kind of the layers that make up how deep we could go. So the first thing is, we need to prevent unauthorized access. That's the easiest thing. If you want to secure your systems, turn off the server and nobody can get in. Real easy way. Not very effective for business, but um, it does work well. So first, keeping everybody out that shouldn't be there. Well, if you keep everybody out, there's some people that have to get in and do something. So you have to allow authorized access. Once somebody has access, you've got to control what they're able to do, um, where they're able to go, what changes they're allowed to make. When they're making changes, you have to have something in place to detect that activity to know whether that change is allowed or not. And this isn't just error correction and error handling, that's important too. This is almost problem handling, kind of like you would treat error handling as well. And when you detect activity that isn't correct, you've got to find a way of resolving those issues. So when we look at kind of the security landscape, and this is my interpretation of the domain, there's lots of different ways to split it depending on how you want to parse down. Some people like parsing from the network down in by risk, but really you're talking about, the first thing is identity access management. This is the entire, this is the management of who your users are and what they can do. It's the whole landscape, and it's both external for all your external systems and your clients, it's internal for all of your internal users, and typically those are managed separately. And if they're not managed separately, go find somebody in your company and start having that conversation, because that's a problem, and ask Target if it's a problem for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Records management. What are you doing with the information? How is it being stored? Where, where is it going? And we're going to go into deeper uh, deep dive in each of these. Um, fraud. How do you determine whether a change, whether intentional or accidental, is fraud or a problem or allowed? Um, and then also network and physical security are important, like access to systems, access to server rooms, access to filing cabinets even. Those pretty much don't pop up as much in um, a normal project life cycle, so we're going to kind of skim over those, but we can talk about them more later. So let's take a look at identity access management because for a lot of us, this is, this is core and this is part of our projects, but we need to go a lot deeper. So the first thing is identity. Who is the person? And this is also referred to as coarse grain entitlements. So entitlements, what am I able to do? Coarse grain. All it is is who is who. Um, and how are we determining that that person is who they say they are? And there's two versions of doing that. One is challenge response, which is our most famous username, password, um, security question, answer. These are typical challenge response. But companies more and more <coughs> are moving towards adaptive authentication, which is a risk-based approach to determining who someone is and then determining what they're able to do. When we get into access, it's fine grain entitlement, so it's much finer, it's much more discreet. This is what I can do, where I can do it, um, what am I tracking, what am I re recording. And there's really two ways when you're looking at fine grain entitlements of how to manage them. Sometimes you want to put them all in one master system. You can have an entire identity access management platform that essentially manages all your permissions. The advantage is one software cost and an infrastructure cost to handle all your identity management. 
you can usually get a system that's extremely robust and tied into a lot of fraud engines and other areas. Um, and it's very easy to make upgrades and use information from one system to another effectively. Um, the problem is it can be very difficult across different systems knowing who's who, what they're allowed to do. It can be very complicated and expensive. Distributed works really well when you have applications that have their own security model, and it's a very good one. So you don't want to take a system that's awesome, like maybe your HR system, and move all of its permissions out and reproduce them in another system. That's just a lot of cost. So it is a case-by-case -case basis. So when we talk about adaptive authentication, we're talking about a risk-based approach. So it's called step-up authentication. And the easiest way to think about this is, think about your credit card. Um, in the old days, you had the card and you swipe, you're good to go. Nobody cared. Now, how you swipe, where you swipe, what you buy, what your patterns go into complex models. So there's times where you'll get notified, hey, we noticed an unusually large purchase online. Is this you? And if so, reply yes. That's a step up authentication, a basic one. Others may actually block the transaction. So the same thing can happen in your systems, which means the more risky the behavior, the more risky the change or participation in your system, the more you need to validate who it is. If you shop on Amazon, you can, once you, you can shop freely. When you log in, you get customized information. If you try and look at past orders or make a change, it makes you log in again. Um, or can add a, a second authentication method um, that we'll talk about. So what are some of those things? First, one of the easiest things is IP blocking, which means if you're only doing business in a certain area or a certain country or a certain continent, block out the rest of the world. If you are not doing business in Asia and Eastern Europe, block them out. That is where almost all of the really, really good hackers and organized crime units are coming from. Um, there's others. Now, can they use VPN and mask their IP address? Yes, so that's never enough. Location, geo-blocking, geo-profiling. If you think about it, every time you log in, your browser knows generally where you are so it can give you customized ads. Your phone knows where you are. You can use that information to build risk-based profiles. If somebody is in Canada and they're working on your system, maybe it's low risk and you just let them go. Suddenly, if they're in Mexico or Colombia or Antarctica, you're like, yeah, this, I don't know that my person's traveling. Let me do another way to make sure that they're who they say they are. Um, a lot of us have had trusted device. It's, you know, check and, check and remember me or don't ask me again on this device. I use this computer a lot. That way you know you've already established that second step so you could skip it in the future. Biometrics are getting much better. Um, they still got a ways to go, or they're very expensive for the ones that work reliably, but they are getting better. Um, so fingerprints, um, your face and face scanning, especially on cell phones, is a great way. The way you shake your phone or the way you move a mouse is actually pretty secure print. We all do it differently. There's micro differences in how our bodies work, and you can actually tell someone, uh, tell who they are. So one of the areas to look into, if you've got and just want a, the simplest way for somebody to get into your app, how they shake it is a, actually an awesome way of doing it because it, it's quickly identifiable and as long as they're not making changes, it may be low enough risk. Um, tokens, we used to see these in the little keychain tokens that kept repeating. Now um, you've got apps on your phone, you've got um, ones that can be text messaged, text messaged to you. Phenomenal way of doing it. So I, I don't know if you heard, and I haven't even had a chance to update it, but recently they revealed that basically Yahoo, um, Microsoft Mail, um, Gmail, all lost millions and millions of username and passwords. And so they said, well, change your password. Okay, that doesn't do much good. Um, if you haven't switched over to two-step authentication for those accounts, it pretty much locks people out. It makes it nearly impossible for people to get into the accounts because of the key combination and the fact that one part gets stolen on the company side, the other part would have to be stolen real time on your area, pretty slim chance. You're really reducing your risk. Or basically, you don't have to outrun a bear 
you have to outrun everybody, at least one other person who the bear is chasing. So you just want to make yourself less of a target than someone else. Uh, same thing for your systems. Temporary keys, SMS, email, phone, we've done those. Um, to help your users, give them, you can give them um, account images or, or questions or phrases so that they know or you're training them to not fall for phishing scams because there's no way that somebody would guess. So if I pick an animal, I give it a really silly name so that my spouse and I know that that's really the site and we didn't click through the wrong one. Um, CAPTCHA is a way of making sure that systems aren't trying to log in and will reduce kind of a brute force attack. Um, another way of looking at it is third-party identity. So you know you can log into a lot of sites using Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, and in a lot of cases, if the risk is low, do you really care if they're logging in using a known account on another company? Probably not. If nothing else, you're distributing the security risk to over two different places, and if they're just reading information, it's really low risk. Then you could step up if they want to make changes. So if you think about financial systems or insurance systems, if I'm seeing recent transactions or balances, it's pretty harmless. If I want to do a claim or do a transfer, I need to step up that authentication because my risk has just gone much higher. And again, as we're going through, a lot of this is deer in headlights. This is a lot of heavy information. So please feel free to stop me. So one of the biggest challenges, especially when you're looking at multiple systems or multiple client systems, is trying to identify which users belong to who. And especially if you're dealing with a company account with multiple users or a family account, it gets really complicated knowing, okay, which Bob is the Bob you care about? So if I'm centrally managing my systems, or I'm using a single sign-on to jump from one system to another, how do I know that I'm sending Bob to the right Bob? And that Bob is different than Bob and Ginny, or Bob and Paul, or SpongeBob? Which Bob am I really worried about? So this, if you, when you, what usually happens is, is each team in their own little silo creates their models, and then later on, there's a big investment project to try and tie them all together into a unified portal or system, and that's when the nightmare happens. What if you start with the nightmare and make it simple for beginning? Have a committee, have a group, somebody that's centrally managing and helping with this. Dramatically, dramatically reduce your costs moving forward. Um, and why, so why do we care? So really, one of the big problems is username and passwords have, are a complete failure. And the problem is I can use the same information or tend to use the same information on different accounts, on social media, on email, which means as I hack different systems, the people on the other side can look for these patterns and use that to figure out which encryption method or hack the encryption. Or they don't even have to hack the encryption. Because I know that if I go to almost any system and enter in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I'm going to get into a lot of accounts. So these are the top 25 passwords as of 2014. I haven't found the 2015 or 2016 list yet. Um, so look at these. If you see any of your current passwords on here, please go home and change them. Change them at lunch. Um, not recommended. But can you believe people are still using these? I mean, there's a few odd ones. Uh, I enjoyed Let Me In. That was kind of a funny one. So where does this become a problem? So as we're developing these systems, as we're developing our access models, when we're not clear about the entitlements, we're leaving room for problems. So what can somebody view? What can they modify? What can they delete? And a lot of us, especially on the front end, are famous for doing a soft delete, which is I want them to delete it on the front end, but I actually want to keep the record on the back end. And that can be very problematic. Um, another thing that we don't realize happens is we can create embedded groups or inherited permissions. So if you create different user groups, but I can add an individual to one group or another, or I put one group as a member of a next group, I can create some serious problem. On collaboration sites, one of the most famous things to do is all NT authenticated users have read access. Makes sense. You're collaborating across your company. If anyone can log into your company, shouldn't they be able to see a collaboration site where it's general information or a help desk application? Well, look at what happened with Target. All of their vendors were in um, AD. So 
using an LDAP server, they're able to get in and see all that information using the same logins. Um, also, we can make assumptions that, well, I didn't really document it or I didn't consider it because the security department is going to take care of that or they probably would have known or, uh, of course, a developer would just do something. And, and that's not always the case. So there's two really important terms to consider when you're building these models. The first is segregation of duties. This means that I should never have permission to do two roles that bypass my security model. And the easiest thing to remember for segregation of duty is a developer who can develop and write code and check in codes in a lower environment must never, ever, 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 ever have access to your production environment. Because that gives that individual the ability to insert malicious code or an error and push it to production and have bypassed all of your controls. Mistakes are, you, most people are good hearted. So you're really talking about mistakes more than you are malicious, but you've got to be careful for both. Least privileged access annoys most people, but this is the bare minimum permissions, the bare minimum ability to do your job. So you want to strip it all down to the absolute minimum and only give people the access or permission to do what they want, or what they need to do, not what they want. And then if you really need to, you can have them apply for more permission and justify it and have a check and balance. But that process, that operations, has to be part of our projects. And for most of us, it just isn't today. And a lot of the systems I developed, this stuff just didn't exist to me. I didn't even realize it. And again, I want to remind you, 55% of internal incidents are because of problems with privileged access. Um, and of the people who did this intentionally, 40% did it for money. They did it because they were skimming money, stealing money, or selling records, or using it to get a new job. Bringing in proprietary information, corporate espionage, and using it to land a better, more high-paying job with a competitor. Um, and if you don't think that people will do that, look at how much your raises are year after year versus what you can get hopping companies, and you'll see a big financial motivation. So let's move over to records management a little bit. So a record is any piece of data or information. It could be a form, it could be a field, um, a lot of ways of looking at it. But when you're talking about records management, you've got to be aware of the changes. Are you worried about versioning? Or can, uh, can any changes be made? How is that record being transported or moved or saved? Where is it being stored? And this is physical records too. If anybody still has paper-based products or printouts, those have to be part of your project and system requirements as well. And retention requirements. So updates and versioning. These are really tied to your fine-grained entitlements, which means the more I can do, the more risk I have, the more concern you need to be about how you're versioning, what you're updating, when it's updated, what information. So do you really care what was changed, who changed, and how is it changed? Um, you don't want to create a data nightmare where you're storing and saving everything and causing chaos, but you've got, so you've got to find the appropriate level. And why do you even need versions? Do you need versions? Do you need a history? If I'm doing a transfer or approving steps in a workflow, do I need to have every step stored for history? In some cases, the answer is yes. In other cases, probably not. Or do I only need to have that for forensic analysis? So in a system I worked on, um, we captured uh, approved project approvals. And actually, every company I've captured project approvals. How long do I store those for? My answer has always been, as long as I need to cover myself for somebody saying that I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And then I can delete and get rid of them. Because if nobody can come back and yell at me, that's officially the end of my records retention, um, depending on what your company rule is. Encryption. So this is one thing we forget. Encryption's awesome. Except for the fact that your systems have to have a way of accessing the data. So if your system can get to the data, somebody can use your system to decrypt that information and they can bypass your encryption. So stealing data out of a database, not as, not as worried. Using your system to get and retrieve that information, much, much worse. 
Um, if you're doing encryption, you may want to insist on doing things. Obfuscation basically means taking something and mixing it up, using a pattern before you encrypt it so it makes it even harder. So even if I decrypt it, I've decrypted it into something that looks like uh, code or something that's not understandable. And seeding actually puts in false information that can be removed later. So if my password was one, two, three, four, five, six, that encrypted and obfuscated may have a bunch of, it may be all jumbled up before encrypted, and it may contain letters as well. So now, one, two, three, four, five, six, for you or you or me, will all look differently because I'm seeding them with different information that the system then rips out. The problem is, with any code, you can break it through repetition. Um, so the more users you have, the more people repeat their passwords or information, and the more I can find what, what matches and use that to get past your security. Um, storage. Um, what hap you know, most of our records, especially with BI applications today, aren't just used in our systems. We're pulling them out, we're doing reporting, we're doing data warehouses. When I remove a record from the host system, I have now removed all security and controls around that data. So as I move it over, I have now, I have to either reproduce that in a BI environment, or I have to obfuscate it so it can't be tied to real information. So when Google or Apple or any big Facebook says, we track every single thing you do so that we can sell ads against your space, but it's not individually identifiable, what they've done is they, they're taking your usage, putting it against a token that gets updated by your information, but that token isn't you. It's not your account. So they create basically a phantom ghost profile in their analytics engine that happens to map to your profile and it's almost impossible to tie the two together. So that gives you a level of safety. Um, it's expensive. It's harder to do that. Um, when you think about retention, first, if you've got a retention policy, follow it. If you don't have one, work and see if you can set one and create it. Um, one of the things that I didn't understand, because I am a pack rat, having been burned on projects and burned by clients before, I say every email, every correspondence, every file version, I can go back 20 years and I've got files securely, somewhat securely stored. Um, but the problem that I didn't realize is that opens you up to discovery, which means if your company gets sued, everything related to a certain space gets turned over to the attorneys and they can look for mistakes, errors, it opens up huge vulnerabilities. Or, as your policies and this technology has changed, it may reveal customer data, um, shortcuts, problems uh, in your system. So I didn't realize that how bad of a problem that could be, but really, you got to have a policy to delete and purge at certain periods. Um, and the biggest thing is, and this is true across the board, you got to be consistent. The more consistent you are, the more successful it's going to be. So hopping over to fraud. So the, when we look at fraud, the first thing is, fraud starts when there's a change in your system. If there's no change, then everything's the same, you've got no problem, it's static. But once you have a change, then we've got to worry about it. So we will never know unless we have awareness of what changes are happening. And then I have to look at that change and, and validate it. Do, is it okay? Do I care about it? Is it hitting a risk profile that I need to do something else? If it falls into a risk area, what's the, what action is supposed to be taken? So think about from an operational standpoint. If data in your system suddenly doesn't match what you were expecting, or there's more changes to certain accounts or certain actions than you would expect, have you built an operational process to look into and do that? Most of us haven't. You wouldn't even think about that, that who's going to take care of that? Who's going to even recognize it? How will anyone know? Or, like companies have had, these changes can go on for years and years without ever knowing it. Um, and then once you know that something needs to be done, you've got to have a process to resolve it. And that resolution is for the problem you find in fixing it, but just like Sony does with their continuous improvement, it's not about fixing the mistake. It's fixing the process that allowed the mistake or fraud to happen in the first place. So you've got to have a mechanism to go back and fix that along the way. Um, so with fraud analytics, really you've got to tie your system into a number of different areas. You've got to tie it into any of your systems that are monitoring data loss. 
Are you scanning data that's going out of your network, emails, attachments, and preventing them from not discovering them after they're sent and the damage is done, but are you stopping them before they go? Um, are you correlating data from different information? Some of the fraud systems are freaking amazing. They're an analyst dream where you can tie them not only into all of your system data, <coughs> but you can tie them into industry data as well. So things like um, Facebook profiles, public information records. So you could actually trace your customers, their habits versus addresses, versus phone numbers, versus known fraudulent accounts. If you've got 17 people all using the same address, you have a high risk of fraud. And so these systems give you a weighted correlation between public and private data and internal system data to help you decide where you have problems. Data integrity, are, is your system creating mistakes? I mean, how many of us have seen one of the movies where they're like, if I just skim that thousandth decimal place in a transaction, I can build up millions of dollars over a year. That's true. I mean, that's where some of these errors can really add up to a company. It's why, I don't know, but I've never been able to balance my checking checkbook. Now it's better because the systems are doing it, but before, I just never could get it to match and I never understood why. Also, if you go out with a group tipping, why everybody throws in enough money and you always come up short. And I figured that one out. It's because nobody adds in tax. You add in your meal and then you round up and then you add in your tip, but you're forgetting to add in the tax to it. But that's a side of it. Anyway, but those things happen naturally when we just don't consider all the data. Um, and then you've got to be able to monitor the activity to be able to detect things as they're happening. <coughs> so, um, one of the most important things about the conference, and thanks for coming here, the first session is always the hardest because you're trying to decide what to go to, figure out what room, especially for anyone new. But the conference people, if you see anyone with a diversified communication badge, please take time to thank them today for the hard work they do putting this conference together, finding the speakers, finding the topics, the venue, it is insanely complicated, so thank them. And also, to make sure these conferences get better and better every year, please go and um, fill out the conference evaluation, let them know what you like, what they didn't like. They really do take these things seriously. And they follow up with each and every speaker about every session to look for ways to improve, and that determines who comes back year to year or what topics come back. Um, again, stay connected. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Reach out anytime you want. Uh, anytime you want. Um, and then in the handout and in the appendix were some of the fun facts. Um, so what I wanted to do now is find out. I want to find out from as many of you as willing to share what is something new or different that you learned today that you think you can apply to your job or your life um, when you get when you're done with the conference. So who can share something that they, that they learned or they can apply from today, from this session? I want to make sure everybody at least is walking away with one gem that they can reuse. Yes? Um, um, I come from academia, so we're right now going through this thing about purging the documents. Yep. You would not believe how many faculty are so resistant at the thought of getting rid of their students' social security numbers. Oh, absolutely. And now I have a, a reason because of the legal aspect of it, of it can come back to haunt you as an individual. And, and a way of saying that, another way of saying that is, if you're the source of the breach, can your department absorb a fifty to $88,000 cost for that loss? Why wouldn't you have a chargeback model for fraud or lost information? Um, the fact that universities even have social security numbers or national, and part of that I know is because of uh, f uh, finance, but then shouldn't it be attached to the loan and not the university? Um, so Clark Howard is a consumer advocate in the states, and one of his biggest advice is, Whatever you do, do not give your social security number or that type of identifier to any medical institution because right now they're the number one loss of records. So as we're looking through this, in the old days, you would lose your information. Someone would log in as you and strip your bank account, charge stuff on your credit card. It was horrible. The problem we have now is if I was malicious, and I tried to go after each one of you, that's a lot of work. 
But if I find one company you all have in common, one place you shop, a grocery store, and I can get your information from there, I can get all of you at once. But that's not even what the hackers are doing. Because then I have to go and I have to use it and I have to exploit. And when you do those transactions, you're really exposing yourself to risk. Um, if I use a stolen credit card, my chances of getting caught or arrested go up pretty high. But why wouldn't I sell that to somebody who's willing to take the risk? Because I could sell each person's data over and over again. And that's what's happening. That's why we're seeing these large breaches of government systems, of educational systems, of companies, is even at pennies per record, the millions and billions of dollars that can be generated by reselling and selling that information to groups that then aggregate it and figure this stuff out and then spread it out to people who are willing to take that risk, it's being sold multiple times and that's where the big risk is. And that's why companies are going to be the primary attack. Users are the weakest point in any system. That's how people will get into the system to steal records, steal information, or do bad things like they did to Sony. Um, so really that's, that's up the game and, and, and we're, we're so far behind. I mean, there's no way you can even catch up to something like that because you're, you're, you're catching up to something that's ever changing and evolving. You're always reacting. So that makes it problematic. Um, something else someone wants to share, something else that someone can apply. Yes? I really liked all the uh, examples of the adaptive authentications. You know, I know about a couple of them, but all the other ones, that's, that's helpful when I talk to my information security guys. It's fun, and boy, do they love to talk about it. There is some amazing, really cool stuff on the horizon. A lot of this is built into a lot of the new security and authentication platforms. Um, a lot of them support single sign-on, so that if you have a central authentication, you can then jump people to multiple systems, and then allow that either use allow that system to manage fine-grained entitlements or have a centralized repository, because those systems can do both. And a lot of them actually have a hybrid model where they can do both at the same time and feed into any of your fraud analytics system. So, the, and the tools actually, you don't have to buy from some of the big providers. Um, the tools, there's some great small and medium business focused systems, IAM systems, that are, are really affordable considering. I mean, you're not looking at a five to $10 million investment anymore for this stuff. Um, uh, some of them are cloud based. Um, there's a number of systems that will authentic, handle and manage your authentication into the cloud seamlessly, and it, it works great. They can, and they've got geolocation, geotagging tied into it, um, IP blocking. Um, they can do. Uh, they can not only look at um, trusted devices, but they can also disallow rooted devices. Um, and so, I just ran into a system the other day. I was having trouble with one of my apps and was looking through support, and it said, we're blocking any device that's been rooted because you're too big of a risk to us. Yes? I, I have the same. I want to talk to you about this um, adaptive authentication. You've just done that. But my one question here in terms of what you have, multi-factor examples about geo-blocking and stuff, yes. can you apply this to a personal phones? Yes. Okay. So, so your phone has three methods of geolocating you. First is the same thing that happens when you're on your computer. Um, generally, based on your IP address or network, they roughly can identify what area of the country, country or city you probably are in. That's pretty simple. The next is, uh, especially on a phone, your um, carrier. So which tower you're hitting is giving your location. So you've got tower geolocation that's tied in and, and transported across the network. You also have GPS, so if you have your GPS turned on, or have an app that forces or allows or makes you use GPS, that further pinpoints um, your location. And then the other is Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi works the same as a network, that it assumes that if you're connected to a Wi-Fi network, that's connected to certain access points on the overall internet traffic, um, that you're probably in that area. It doesn't stop spoofing, it doesn't spot, stop VPN, but it, it will reduce a lot of the issues. Um, I'm interested in where you said something about blocking Asia and what's not. Yeah. So how, as a, again, a personal phone, how can I block, like, can I do that or not? Okay, so that's, that's a little harder. Okay. So um, I don't know, that's a good one. I don't know, so there's a lot of security apps you can run 
and some of them may have that built in. I don't know of any way to do that on an individual phone basis to block traffic that's going out. Usually it's done on a system basis, so what you do is you set up your either your application, your firewall, or your network traffic. You create a list of, every country has uh, a unique IP string, and you just block all of those out. Um, WordPress and other public sites actually have lists that you can add, and you can get them off the internet. It takes forever, especially if you have to type it in. Um, so I would also recommend, there are a number of very, very affordable VPN apps that work on your computer, your home, um, and on your phones. Um, the one I happen to use is Private Internet Access. It's $25 USD per year. And what it does is, it logs into a secure server. And it runs all of my internet traffic through their server, securely and encrypted, so that if I'm on a public Wi-Fi, like if I join the public Wi-Fi, anyone here could hack my, back hack my phone and probably get in. If I'm using VPN, then it can't even see me on the network. It sees a point connected and it can't get in. So it, it com makes your phone completely safe. The other really cool thing is, is you can use automatic server selection so it'll find whatever's fastest for where you are and connect, or you can select certain access points where they run their VPN servers. So if I'm in Asia, I connect through a US VPN server, which means Netflix recognizes me as being in the US because that's where my traffic is originating from, and I can watch Netflix in Hong Kong. So it's a way of bypassing, so that's a way of, that's how hackers are also bypassing geo-blocking, is they're using VPNs. It's also why, I don't know if you're getting it here, but I'm getting flooded with marketing calls and fraud calls on my cell phone from local numbers. And what they're doing is, is they're using voice over IP, they're generating a number through their calling system that's a local phone number, and using that to send through. By the time you get it blocked, they've dropped the number and moved on to another one. So I actually use an app that's a uh, White Pages app that actually does a directory lookup for every call coming in and bounces it against a known spam and fraud list that's actually crowdsourced. So if I get a call and it's a marketing, I mark it as fraud, I explain what it was, and then they block calls based on the, um, uh, based on the uh, crowd's risk rating and what they're saying it is. And they do categories. Is this a sales call? Is this... Um, a robocall, things like that. Um, I've gotten a couple this morning already that have popped up, and fortunately they've said it blocked it, so I was like, eh, not taking that call. Other lessons, other things, other questions um, that you had? I have a question. We, we uh, had a meeting break, and um, I that caused the major break to purchase the token. And I'm like seeing things on the network and I'm like, oh, this is not good. And nobody needs to listen. So I, um, because I might say the wrong company, I won't say it. There is a com strong competitor to Cisco for routers. And recently they discovered that there is internet traffic going back to Chinese government web addresses off of those routers at the firmware level. Um, I purchased, um, I, I do travel overseas, and I had gotten a, a phone from a very, one of the top providers in that area and got rid of it because I can't tell what's been rooted and I wasn't going to take the risk because you're absolutely right. Um, it's tough. The other problem is most things are manufactured in Asia. So even from a reputable place, somebody could be installing. So monitoring the network traffic, having a group to look into that, or hiring another company to do that for you. Outsourcing it or outsourcing some of the resolution is probably one of the most affordable ways because it is that's going to be a huge problem. And, and I don't know I don't know how bad it is. There's no way of knowing what they're doing it for. Um, most likely what's happening is it's kind of like sifting through garbage or, or going to the beach or to a lake and using a metal detector. You're going through a ton of sand looking for a coin or a ring or something valuable. What they're doing is, is they're getting all the information and then giving it to groups who are 
just processing and, and trying to get through to look for information they can later use to get into a system they want to, which is secure government, research facilities, corporate espionage. So keep gathering information until you see somebody you want to go after, and then use that to try and get in the back door. All right, we've got, um, there's about three minutes left. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for coming here today. Um, you had a lot of choices, I appreciate it. Um, if, if you'd like and have other people um, that you'd like to bring back a copy of the handout, um, you're welcome to. This and every presentation I give is um, available for free on my website, um, so feel free to pick up a green card here. Um, all the presentations, I've got videos, the downloads, the handouts, so you can get an electronic copy. Um, so please stay connected, share it with friends if it's valuable. I don't make any money off of it, it's just something I do because I like sharing. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and for you, Hans, uh, on behalf of Project Core and Business Analysis, we would like to thank you for your time and effort. Please accept this gift as a token. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.